Welcome back. You know, a lot of times in this program, uh, we highlight uh, the darker side of the police force when there's a big story relating to corruption, abuse of power, um, procedure has gone the wrong way. We're going to talk about it like every newscast and every program like this should. But what often goes unsaid is that whoever puts on a uniform, man or woman, they put their lives on the line every day and they do it for the sake of public safety. Now, if you need a reminder of it this week, it became painfully clear we saw this not once, but twice. On Tuesday, Nassau County Police Officer Arthur Lopez, he died after being shot during a routine traffic stop near Belmont Park. 29-year-old was on patrol when he and his partner spotted a damaged car and they suspected was part of a hit and run. Officers followed the car and pulled it over. After a brief exchange of words, the driver left the vehicle and fired one round into Lopez's chest. And then on Wednesday, an off-duty, I want you to remember this, off-duty police officer with his girlfriend and wife at the time here, off the job, off the clock, he was shot while trying to stop an attempted robbery in the Bronx. The 27-year-old Ivan Marcano, he was with his girlfriend, I'm sorry, at the time, when they witnessed a robbery. He got out of his car, identified himself as an officer, and then one of the suspects shot him in the chest. Marcano then followed the suspects as they tried to get away. With one hand applying pressure to his own wound, he fired two shots, killing one of the suspects. And this afternoon, um, another of the suspects was brought into custody. Joining us now to talk about some of the challenges that police officers face while on the job, Tom Rapetto. Thomas Rapetto is a former Chicago Police Department commander and uh, commander of detectives, as well as former president of New York City's Citizens Crime Commission. He's the author of many books about policing and crime. His latest out this month called American Police, A History, The Blue Parade, Volume 2. Um, thank you, Tom. I appreciate a few nice minutes. Nice to be and here. And you know what? Um, I, I just want to take a few minutes because it was on the public consciousness, but all of us either have friends on the job, have covered police in some way or another, we forget sometimes because um, we only hear about certain stories. But when I saw what Officer Marcano did, um, it made me do a double cake. And, it, you know, you understand this, but for a lot of folks, every day when they get into the precinct until they come home at night, there's a chance they're not going to come home, right? That's correct. It is a very dangerous job. That's not exactly a revelation. But they are also on duty 24 hours a day. This officer was off duty, but you're never off duty. He saw a crime, he acted. That's what a police officer is supposed to do, and he was badly wounded. And, but he managed to save the citizen who was being, who was being robbed. The officer in the, in the traffic shoot, he just made a, a traffic stop. Those are not usually, they don't usually result in firearms, but sometimes they do. Sometimes you get people complain. Well, the policeman came up to me when he stopped my car, or to question me, and he looked like he was holding his gun. <laughs> People have been shot by motorists all of a sudden. Sudden attacks occur. It, it, you, you don't know what's going to happen from one minute to the next out there. What's and that, the should, that should be kept in mind when we talk about police shootings. And Tom, what's one of the misconceptions? Um, it doesn't matter whether somebody's a cop in a big city, a, a suburb, or a rural area. What's one of the misconceptions that you've, I mean, you've covered police uh, your whole life. You've, you've worked in police departments. Uh, you've been in the Midwest. Obviously, you've been in New York. What's the one frustration that they have? Well, I, I think cops think the public doesn't support them. Actually, polls don't find that. Polls often find that people do support the police, but it somehow doesn't come over. There's a lot of criticism of the police, and police are not above criticism, and sometimes certain things are done that are very wrong. But the police are out there defending the public. They should be given the benefit of the doubt if their motives are good. If their motives are bad, that's a different story. Policeman sees a fellow standing on a street corner at midnight near an alley. That's a policeman's job to really see why is that fellow standing at the mouth of an alley at midnight. Now we've got proposals in New York City that he'd have to come up and say, Hi, I'm Officer Tom Rapetto. Uh, I'm wondering what you're doing there. Could I search you? And then if the guy says you can, you have to give him uh, uh, some kind of written notice of the search. I don't think they're going to be making too many searches because what's liable to happen is the guy will go for a gun. Uh, you know, we can debate, and we have many times in this stop and frisk, but at a later day, I want to talk with what we saw here. It's part of the reason, um, and again, for those of us who know police, 
there's a frustration. There's almost an us and them in certain neighborhoods that they go into. And it's a mutual uh, distrust here from both sides. It's part of the problem that sometimes cops protect with that blue wall here, um, guys that shouldn't be protected, and then they get smeared uh, with public distrust like all of them, and then we got situations that, you know, you're like, wait a minute, you know, uh, the, the guys who did that to Rodney King, they're not reflective of all cops or even the majority of cops or even the tiny population of them. But now everybody uh, at that time period paints them all with a big swath of blue. Is that, in retrospect, now that you're a little bit farther away from it, well, sometimes a mistake of Actually, costume? in the neighborhoods where there's the greatest support for the police are the high crime neighborhoods are the minority neighborhoods, because they really need the police there. And what they want, very simply, is protect me, but respect me. If, if you can manage to do that, then you've done your job. People will back you in those areas because they know how bad crime is. When I was a police officer, sometimes they would say to me, as I was, be careful, officer, or have your gun ready on, on this call. That fellow up there on the third floor is dangerous. They, they want the law enforced, but they want it enforced with some respect. Simple things. Police respond to the scene of a crime. Everybody's got their gun out. It's a robbery in progress. Then the, they determine that the call is not bona fide or something. They're still holding their guns. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people tell me that when, when I used to go around with various commissions investigating these things. Why were they all holding their guns? You know, a gun can accidentally discharge. If, if, I, could yeah. Yeah, if, I, if I could just, yeah, if I could just, I'm a former prosecutor in the Bronx. And, um, you know, just turning the attention away from the police, but onto the, crim onto the criminals. So what I find really the most outrageous part of this is that how quickly the criminals these days, at least it appears, are willing to draw a gun and fire on someone they know is a police officer. I think it's, again, mm -hmm. you know, citizen on citizen crime. We all understand that. But, the, but what it takes for an individual to then draw on a police officer and shoot a poli known police officer, whether on duty or off duty, off duty, they're identifying and themselves. This, Brad? this and, is and something. This goes to your former walk of life. The guy in, in the fate of shooting of the cop was a bad guy oh, with yeah. a rap sheet forever. He never should have been out there. He was paroled early. It's for a longer conversation, but yeah, that I is mean, a longer and conversation. look at some of the guns that are on the streets now that the cops have to deal but, with that but, they never used but to. But when I mean, you fire on a cop, you know what? There's guns. There's people that have been paroled early. That's gone on forever. Okay, and uh, believe well, but, me, I'm not giving a pass. But, Tom, but why, why, why shoot on a police officer? Why do you think people officer? are so more willing, or seemingly so much more willing, to do that in this day and age? There are more people willing to commit violence. There have been various explanations. They see it on TV the use of drugs, et cetera. Actually, New York City is coming in with the fewest murders in about 50 yeah. years this year if the present trends continue. I just wanted to point out there was a civilian killed at the same time, police officer, and that was a vicious thing. That poor man yeah. was just <coughs> sitting in his car. He, he wasn't a police over, officer. He was on his cell phone. Yeah. Yeah, right. yeah, he, he was just sitting in the car, and the, the, the car jacked him and, and, and killed him. That's, that's the kind of it. And I'm sorry to say, individuals who will do that are not in short supply. That's not most people, but there are such individuals out there. Police know such individuals are out there. And I'm telling you, I'm going to be safe rather than sorry if I'm going in. If I get a complaint because somebody said I didn't uh, behave like Lord Chesterfield or something, well, I'd rather that than that I be killed. Right. Well, Tom, i got to have you back here because the book... Um this guy was asked to be one of the plumbers. Um, uh, yeah, I mean, literally. Oh, wow. Yeah, and there's a lot here that uh, we want to talk about. And I want to try and do it in 30 seconds, so we're going to do it at a later date. But what I want to do tonight, and you help me with it, is um, with the loss of life of yet another officer in the line of duty and then another heroic act by one, we talk about it when there's problems, but we should also recognize, um, obviously, sometimes when they even make the ultimate sacrifice, let alone the everyday. And Tom, say thank, thank you, you very much. Well. And yes. say thank, thank you as you. well. All right. Thank you, Tom, for joining us. We're going to take a quick break. When we return, we are going to switch gears. We're going to head to the football field here, talk about the impact of concussions. And one guy in a corner of New Hampshire has caused a stir and a debate, talking about shutting down his entire football program because of concussions here. And I see Brad, who played college ball at Hofstra, shaking his head. We'll talk about that after this.